this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine PRN Journal Club presentation. I'm your host, Christian Kroll, an emergency medicine and ICU pharmacist at the University of Iowa Hospital and Clinics. To view this recorded presentation, head to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash at ACCP EMED PRN. And for PRN members, slides can be found under the business document section on the ACCP Emergency Medicine PRN website. We have Dr. Jessica Pham, who is the current PGY2 Emergency Medicine Pharmacy Resident at Denver Health Medical Center. And she will be presenting her journal article today, which is IV hydromorphone versus IV acetaminophen for older patients with acute severe pain. Thank you so much for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jessica Pham, and I am the PGY2 Emergency Medicine Pharmacy Resident here at Denver Health Medical Center. Today, I'll be presenting Kali and colleagues' recently published article, The Intravenous Hydromorphone versus Intravenous Acetaminophen for Older Patients with Acute Severe Pain. Now, just as a brief review of the background inspiring this research, pain management is generally driven by you know, the type of pain a patient is experiencing. Is it nociceptive, neuropathic, or mixed in nature? And perhaps differentiating the etiology may assist in the selection of the various types of non-pharmacologic and pharmacologic management that may be utilized. However, as we may be very familiar with, pain management is limited by the heterogeneity and patient response to therapy, and thus just very subjective in nature. Now, for more objective characterization of pain, there, of course, exist numerous pain scales that may quantify the pain a patient is experiencing or even qualify the pain the patient is experiencing. And just to name a few, this includes the Defense and Veterans Pain Rating Scale as shown, the Behavioral Pain Scale, Critical Pain Observation Tool, Numeric Pain Scale, Wong Baker Faces, and the Pain Assessment in Advanced Dementia. Again, just to name a few. Now, ultimately, pain is not a new concept in patient care. And what inspired this particular study was the patient population of older adults, and very specifically, pain management in the acute setting. But again, what other literature precedes this study? In 2012, Platts, Mills, and colleagues conducted a retrospective cohort study assessing adults presenting to the emergency department due to a chief complaint of motor vehicle crash. And this was largely a descriptive study comparing the pain management of those aged 18 to 64 years compared to those 65 years and greater. And the study found that older adults were less likely to receive analgesics in the emergency department and less likely to receive analgesics prescribed at discharge compared to their younger patients. And this suggested that elderly adults' pain were less likely to be treated. In 2009, Chang and colleagues then conducted a single-center randomized control trial that assessed adults at least 65 years of age who presented to the emergency department with acute severe pain and compared a weight-based dose of intravenous hydromorphone at 0.0075 milligrams per kilogram to morphine at 0.05 milligrams per kilogram and found no difference in efficacy or safety between the two agents at the 30-minute mark after administration. And then in 2013, Chang and colleagues conducted a single-center randomized control trial assessing adults again ages 65 years and greater presenting to the ED with acute severe pain. And they compared increments of 0.5 milligrams of intravenous hydromorphone to standard of care, which was largely morphine at four milligrams intravenously. And they discovered that the hydromorphone provided comparable analgesia to the usual care and required ultimately less total morphine milligram equivalents. This now brings us to today's study, which sought to answer the question, among older patients presenting to the emergency department with severe pain, what is the efficacy and adverse event profile of 1,000 milligrams of intravenous acetaminophen versus 0.5 milligrams of intravenous hydromorphone? This was a double-blind parallel group randomized trial at two urban emergency departments assessing adults at least age 65 years or greater who presented to the emergency department with acute severe pain. And the study, of course, compared 1,000 milligrams of intravenous acetaminophen to 0.5 milligrams of intravenous hydromorphone. And the primary outcome was improvement in the numeric pain scale from baseline to 60 minutes after administration. Secondary outcomes included the need for any additional analgesic medication and any adverse events that were attributable to the investigational medication. 
They included, again, adults who are at least 65 years of age and define severe acute pain as follows. Severe meaning the provider's intention to treat the pain with intravenous opiates and acute meaning the onset of pain within seven days of presentation. They excluded quite a few patients. So any patients who had used opioids or tramadol within the past seven days, any use of acetaminophen or a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory within eight hours, prior adverse reaction to opioids or acetaminophen, any recurrent pain that has lasted for at least three months, chronic liver disease, chronic kidney disease, any current use of monoamine oxidase inhibitors, a systolic blood pressure of less than 100 millimeters of mercury, heart rate less than 60, or a baseline oxygen saturation of less than 95% on room air, and lastly, active concerns for dementia. As for the enrollment of the study, approximately 1,900 patients were assessed and nearly 1,600 excluded for various reasons as shown, but largely excluded for a pain not severe enough to warrant intravenous opioids, a pain not considered to be acute, history of chronic kidney disease and previous analgesic medication use. And this left 162 patients to be randomized one-to-one into the study with 81 in each arm. Now for this statistical analysis, the authors provided their sample size calculation as shown, interestingly with a desired effect size of at least 1.3 units reduction on the numeric pain rating scale. They use descriptive statistics for their baseline demographics and inferential statistics for the remainder of analysis. Now, taking a look at the baseline characteristics, there were no significant differences between groups in their demographics, but just to characterize the patient population a little better, the mean age was approximately 74 to 75 years of age, with a large majority of the patient population between ages 60 to 79. Most patients were female in the study, the median duration of pain was two days, and the baseline pain score on the scale of zero to 10 was 10 in both groups. And lastly, while there was no very specific characterization of the type of pain that was experienced by the patients, there was an attempt to localize the pain, which was largely the abdomen, flank, and pelvic region, followed by extremities. Now, the pain scores were quantified over time and assessed at 15-minute intervals up until the 60-minute mark for their primary outcome and then approximately 30 to 60 minutes thereafter. In this particular graph, I wanted to highlight that at most, there is only a difference of one point in the numeric rating scale between the two arms in either the median pain scores that is reflected by the dark lines within the bars or the means that are reflected by the Xs within the bars of these pain scores. And that said, the interquartile ranges in both groups demonstrates an overall variable response in the patient population to the intervention received, especially at the later time intervals, starting with, for example, that primary outcome at the 60-minute mark. Now, the authors also visualized the change in pain scores via this histogram between baseline and 60 minutes in both arms of the study. Similar to the previous graph, I mostly wanted to highlight the variable response to the intervention received. For instance, the majority of the difference in pain score experienced in the acetaminophen arm was a reduction of two points, whereas the majority of the reduction in pain score with the hydromorphone arm ranged from one point to three to five to even 10. Now, overall, it appears that the patients received a moderate pain reduction, that is a reduction of less than about five points on the scale, as opposed to being pain free. And at the 60 minute mark, the mean reduction in the pain experienced in the acetaminophen arm was 3.6 points compared to 4.6 points in the hydromorphone arm, resulting in an absolute difference of one that was deemed to be statistically significant with a 95% confidence interval ranging from 0.1 to 2. As for secondary outcomes, there were no differences in the requirement of any additional analgesics received in the emergency department any achievement of minimally clinically important improvement in pain or a reduction in the pain score of over 1.3 points on that numeric scale by the 60-minute mark. There was, however, greater incidence in improvement in pain reduction by 50% or less of that baseline pain scale at the one-hour mark in the hydromorphone arm compared to acetaminophen. And lastly, while not statistically significant, there was a higher incidence of adverse effects related to medications that were recorded during that emergency department visit attributed to nonspecific reactions such as dizziness, drowsiness, headache, and nausea 
with neither incidence of those adverse effects in either arm being more incidental than the other. Now, overall, the authors concluded that although 0.5 milligrams of the intravenous hydromorphone was statistically superior to the 1,000 milligram of IV acetaminophen, this difference was not deemed to be clinically significant. Now, overall, the strengths of the study were such that no patients were lost to follow up. The study design was very pragmatic in assessing the acute management of this particular patient population. And the study provides additional safety data for the use of opioids, especially in elderly patients for the acute setting of pain management. However, limitations of the study include just the subjective nature of pain control. Now, the authors use the numeric pain scale, but there are several other pain scales that could be utilized. Perhaps that was their standard of care, but that is important to know in pursuing such a subjective outcome. Another limitation was the hydromorphone dose use. While this dose was reflective of the Chang and colleagues' previous study, Chang and colleagues had used hydromorphone in increments compared to a one-time dose. Now, unfortunately, there is not robust literature for dose finding to help guide the dosing schematics, which the authors of this study had acknowledged. But it is otherwise interesting that two agents with very different mechanisms of actions were used with acetaminophen at, for example, this maximum one-time dose and the other at an otherwise conservative dose. Another limitation is the lack of functional patient-centered outcomes. The study very heavily relied on the numeric pain rating scale, but I would be interested to see another means of quantifying or qualifying the patient's pain. And then lastly, a significant number of patients were excluded. Now, as previously mentioned in the methodology, nearly 1,600 patients were excluded from this study. In general, I understand the desire to decrease as many confounding variables as possible with any study conduction. But the difficulty is that in this patient population of those aged 65 or greater, you would typically expect chronic diseases at baseline. So to exclude any patients with underlying chronic kidney disease or hepatic disease, for example, highlights an otherwise very niche patient population that may undermine the external validity of the study. Ultimately, what I found interesting in the study is the clinical significance of pain relief, which is a pretty difficult outcome to quantify in general. So I would call into question the author's marker of that 1.3 difference on the numeric scale from zero to 10. While there is some evidence to suggest that the 1.3 difference is deemed to be important to patients for acute pain management, I'm not 100% convinced that that is applicable to the elderly patient population. And next, the use of an opioid in one of the study arms and lack of difference in safety events may call into question the general practice and hesitance towards using opioids in the elderly patient population, or more specifically, the pertinence of the American Geriatric Society Beers criteria. So previous literature has cited a hesitancy to use opioids in our elderly patients for concerns of adverse effects such as somnolence and respiratory depression. But the tolerance demonstrated in this study, while a small size population, may bring to light the idea that opioids do have their place in acute pain management, even in the elderly patient population. That said, dosing considerations may be interesting in this patient population. This study has demonstrated that 0.5 milligrams of hydromorphone is tolerated well, but there has, again, not yet been a dose-finding study to really hone in on that optimal dose, if it exists. Now, if the conservative approach in the elderly patient population is desired, perhaps the answer is to then study, similar to Ching and colleagues' previous study, redosing strategies and regular assessment of the patient's pain with the intention to treat with either an alternative medication or to reconsider redosing. And lastly, with pain management, Multimodal analgesia may be considered for the treatment in these patients and potentially can be opioid sparing. What the study did not have was characterization in the type of pain, so it is difficult to make this statement, but perhaps there is value in assessing the response uh, to hydromorphone or acetaminophen in undifferentiated acute pain while pursuing a better workup of the patient upon presentation. Now, overall, I would conclude that patient-centered care is the best approach, meaning tailor the treatment to the type of pain and known patient history if available, with emphasis on trying to characterize the type of pain so that we may better tailor the treatment to the patient. And that is all I have for today. I'd like to open up the floor to any questions. Thank you all for listening. 
If you have enjoyed this presentation content and would like to hear more, subscribe via your favorite podcasting app. Additionally, make sure to check out our YouTube page for all recorded presentations. Thank you for listening to this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine Journal Club presentation. Join us weekly for review and discussion of new journal articles in emergency medicine. This podcast provides general information only. It does not offer individualized medical or professional health care services, including pharmaceutical advice. The contents and materials in the podcast are not intended to be a substitute for inpatient pharmaceutical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. And the use of the contents and materials in the podcast does not constitute a pharmacist-patient relationship. As a result, the information in and materials linked to this podcast are applied at the user or patient's own risk. Users or patients should consult their physician or personal health care professional. The user or patient should not ignore or delay seeking care because of something they heard on this podcast. In case of an emergency, the user or patient should contact their physician, call 911, or go to the nearest medical emergency facility. The views and statements expressed on this podcast are those of the host and guest. It should not be interpreted to reflect the official position or policy of ACCP or the Emergency Medicine PRN.